Hello lovely people, I'm K3N and welcome to my channel. Um, in this video I'm going to do some very very simple um, basic dyeing of fabric with onion skins. Um, now I'm just going to run through briefly what you'll need and also just as a rider I'm not going into great details about mordanting and um, scouring and and so on because that would be you know a whole series of videos this is just a, a basic quick way to get colour onto cloth using onion skins um, I will put some links down below if you want to go further down this rabbit hole but be warned it's a very um, it's a very big rabbit hole um, so what I've got here is I've got a few scraps of cloth now there's two basic types of natural fibres there are cellulose fibres which come from plants, so this is a bit of vintage cotton, quite sheer. Um, that's a bit of vintage cotton sheet. It's another kind of cotton sheet with a much coarser weave. Um, this comes from a thrifted chiffon, silk chiffon scarf, so this is not cellulose because it comes from an animal source, so that's a protein fibre. Um, these are bits of wool blanket, again from an animal, so that's a protein fibre. Um, that's a bit of cotton sheet that I've rust printed as an experiment. I thought I'd throw that in and see what happens. Um, set that to one side actually. I don't really need to tell you about that now. It's got wedded to the silk. This is a piece of vintage Japanese kimono silk that a lovely friend gave to me. So that also from an animal, so protein. And this is called silk noil, which is a much coarser um, weave of silk. Now this is actually new cloth, but it was given to me when I left England by a friend who had a fabric shop. She gave me a whole bolt of it, which I've had now for um, seven or eight years, and I'm coming to the end of it. Um, I won't buy any new after that, but, you know, preciousness. But that's, so everything else is, is vintage or old or thrifted, except for that bit of silk, which is also protein. So it's important to recognise that difference. Um, because when you do get into natural dyeing properly, these two classes of fibres need to be treated differently. Um, the other kind of protein fibre that you can dye as well is silk thread. Or obviously if you're a knitter or a weaver or something like that, you can dye yarn. That's a whole, you know, it's a whole other ball game. Um, but in this video I'm just going to show you with some onion skins and um, really I'm recommending protein fibres, so wool and silk. Um, and thrifted if you can. Um, but I'm also going to throw in unmordanted, um, un untreated, but vintage cotton, just to show you, you know, so we can compare and contrast. Now, the first thing to say is you need to prepare your cloths, um, and you need to, especially new cloths, need to be scoured, which is different depending on the type of cloth. Again, it's quite complex, and I don't want to overwhelm you, but basically a good hot wash in... Um, uh, washing soda or something of that kind, especially for, for cellulose because new cottons are treated with all kinds of wax and oil and you need to get that out. If I'm using vintage cloth, in general I don't scour, it's had a good wash when I've bought it, um, and then I'll just soak it in warm water. And that's always with any kind of dyeing, natural dyeing, rust dyeing, eco printing, I always work with the fabric damp because it, it's much more receptive. Um, I'll put a link to the Myra website, Myra in Canada, um, and they have got a wonderful guide on scouring all the different fibres and so on. Um, okay, so then the next thing to talk about is the dye material. Um, I'll just put the cloth to one side for a moment. So I've been saving onion skins for some little while, and here I've got brown onion skins, I think. Some people call them yellow onion skins, but you know those kinds of onions. And these are just the dry, papery bits, and I just keep them in plastic bags. Uh, sorry, plastic. Paper bags. Paper bags. Don't keep them in plastic bags. Paper bags um, until I've got enough. Um, and then I've also got less, but still a few, red onion skins. Um, and I've kept them separate because that they give different results, so I want to show you that. Um, now I've weighed them both and I've got around 50 grams of the brown, which is a couple of ounces in old money, um, and I've got about 25 to 30 grams of the red, um, which is just over an ounce in old money. Now that is important because, again, in any natural dyeing, with any, with any kind of natural dye, um, or any kind of dyeing actually, um, 
the ratio f with your dye stuff to your fibre by weight is important. It seems obvious, but you know, I'll say it anyway. The more, the less fibre you have in relation to the amount of dye stuff, the stronger the colour you'll get, and vice versa. And you'll often see this referred to as WOF, W-O-F, and that stands for weight of fibre. So you could have, <clears throat> excuse me, 100% WOF, which would mean, say you had, you know, my 50 grams of onion skins, and then I would weigh my dry fibres, my dry cloths and threads and whatever I wanted to dye, and those would also have to weigh 50 grams. And then that would be 100% weight of fibre in relation to the, the weight of the onion skins. I've got just over 50 grams of um, cloth to my 50 grams of onion skin, so I'm, you know, slightly less than my 100% weight of fibre, but, you know, close enough. You, with 50% weight, so you could put 100 grams of cloth to 50 grams of onion skins, and you'd still get colour, you'd just get the strongest colours, you know, with... Am I making any sense at all? <laughs> Basically, weigh your onion skins, weigh your fibres, don't put huge great sheets in with a little handful of onion skins, um, because you won't get much colour at all. Um, if you don't want to get involved in WAF, just, you know, that is a bag of onion skins and a, a little handful of cloth, <laughs> okay? <laughs> if all the numbers are too much for you. Right, so um, you've looked at the Maiwa thing and you've done your scouring, <laughs> um, depending on the, the, the fibre, whether it's a protein or a cellulose or a wool or a silk or whatever. And then you've got your fibres soaking in a bowl. Here's my fibres soaking in a bowl. Um, and I just leave those in water overnight while I make the dye bath. Now you can just put some water in a pan. Here I've just got a, a, it's a stainless steel pan. I have several pans of different kinds. Um, but don't use cooking pans, you know, pans you're going to use for food. Try and thrift an old pan from somewhere. And if you have a stainless steel pan, that's non-reactive, so it won't have any effect on um, the dye. You can also thrift aluminium pans. Often people don't want to use them for cooking anymore. And you can often pick them up quite cheaply in op shops, thrift stores, charity shops, you know, and so forth. And they're wonderful for natural dyeing because there's a theory that some of the alum in the pan might help um, fix the, the colour to the fibre. Um, but anyway, that's for another video. Get a pan that you're not going to put food in anymore and put some water in it, basically. And into that pan then, and you see I've only got about half full of water in this pan, which is, I don't know what the um, what the volume is, but you see it in relation to my hand. And I'm going to chuck in my brown onion skins. Um, I don't think you'll be following along with me, you'll probably watch this and go and do it, but just, um, just to tell you, I've reserved a little handful, just a small handful of each, for the end. So I'm going to show you some quick and easy eco printing as well with those. Um, so just to tell you that, so I'll just chuck all those in there. Sorry for the rustling noise. It's probably mega loud. Put your fingers in your ear. And I'm just going to shove them all in under the water. I'm not wearing gloves because I haven't got anything toxic here. Make sure they all go in there and don't float away. And I'm just going to push them in with my hands and. Um, as long as they're covered, that's enough water, and that's just in terms of energy use, you know. I don't want to be filling a great big pan full of water at this stage. Now the only proviso is you obviously have to make sure it doesn't boil dry. And in fact I don't really boil it at all, I just bring it up to um, a, a gentle simmer and hold it at that point for an hour-ish. Set a timer, don't go away and leave it and let it boil dry. Um, and then take it off the heat leave it overnight just you know with the skins in with a lid on and then the next day I'll show you what we do when it's the next day so I'm going to put that on my wood-fired kitchen range because I've got that um, you of course may have to use another heat source um, and I'm going to do exactly the same thing in another pan uh, with the red onions okay and then I'll be back Okay, my onions are cookering, cooking, cookering. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to prepare some threads to go in the, the dye bath as well. And I've got my silk thread here, silk, undyed silk. Um, and I'm going to wind it round. Basically, you need to wind it round something that you can immerse in, in hot liquid. 
um, and it, ideally it would be something, I've got a, a bit of broom handle here, um, if it fitted in your pan you could wind quite a good quantity of thread around that. Um, but I've only brought one in <laughs> and that's for my eco print bundle later. So, sorry, I'm going to use these clothes pegs. Obviously if you cover the thread up, some of the dye will soak through, but you might get a more uneven effect. Um, so don't put too much on, just, you know, two or three layers of thread. But you see I'm going to get quite a lot on there. Um, you want to use something f smooth so that you don't snag your threads and make them, um, you know, you get the idea. So when I'd wound enough on, onto there, I'll put my thumb in the way and go round like that. And then I'll just tuck the end under, like so, and just pull it up to secure it. And, you know, I'll cover that with two or three layers of thread. I'll do two, one for the red onions and one for the brown onions. And those will be good to go. I thought I would uh, just show you the dye baths. It's the same day, it's a few hours later. I'm probably going to do the next part this evening because my mum's um, messaged me to say she wants to come over tomorrow. So... Um, I wouldn't have time in the morning. But anyway, if you can leave it overnight, that's that's better. Um, I've got a metal spoon coming in here. It's a spoon that I only use for my dyeing. This, none of this is toxic, so, you know, I'm, I'm just saying all this, don't use the same pan and all that, um, in case you get into toxic things. And that's the brown onions. You see the colour of the, the dye bath there? And I should rinse that because of cross-contamination, so pretend I did. I'm just giving it a good drain off. And this is the red onions, look at that colour. Now don't get excited because things may not be what they seem, we'll see. So um, that's how they look. I'm now going to get my hands in there and give the uh, skins a good squeeze to get the last little bit of colour out of them that I can. And then I'm going to strain them both through a colander or a sieve or and again that's something I only use for dyeing but if you've only got onions and water and a clean pan you're probably fine with your colander that you use to strain your vegetables or whatever um, and then you've, you'll end up and keep them separate obviously still and then I'll put the dye baths back in the pan and then we're ready to put the cloth in okay but I just wanted you to see them at this stage okay so this is the red onion dye bath which I have poured through a colander and I've given all the skins a good squeeze between my hands to get all the goodness out and it's it's cool because um, I've had my hands in there so I know I haven't added any water to it or anything all I've done is then put it back in, into the same pan sorry for the noise um, so all I'm going to do now is put my bits in um, my various bits to show you so um, let's start with this this is a bit of the um, Japanese silk, the kimono silk. So I don't mind blotchy, I quite like the effect of blotchy in a cloth. But if you want your dye in any natural dyeing, or any dyeing, <laughs> not only natural, to be as um, uniform as possible, then you need to have a vol enough volume of water for the cloth to be able to freely move around in. Now the volume of water in theory doesn't have any effect on how, you know, how many dye molecules are in, are in there. So imagine that the colour of the dye is all little molecules. You could have a bath full or a teacup and the same number of molecules of dye would be in there. If you go too big with your volume of water obviously the, the molecules may, may not find the cloth. Um, but I start by putting my bits of cloth in the dye bath as it is. And then if I feel it needs more room to move, I'll just add some more water. And then I'll probably add um, hot water from the kettle on the range just to help bring the temperature up quickly. So I just let it go in there and squiddle it around. If I pull it out now, you see it's kind of a pinky colour already, but um, the problem with silk is it clings to itself. So you want to sort of spread it out a bit. Um, and I've got another bit of the, the scarf, the chiffon scarf. So again, let's lay that in. Just giving it room to be in contact with the dye, basically. Um, then I've got two little scraps of cotton, just to show you what happens. So that they're both vintage sheet. I showed you at the beginning, didn't I? 
that's probably not very long ago for you but for me it was several hours ago <laughs> keeping things in my brain another bit of sheet of a different weave but still cotton and that's also cotton very fine cotton gauze with some little coloured dots on but we won't worry about those we'll see what happens <clears throat> Um, and then I've got my bits of woolly blanket, two little bits. This was a thrifted blanket. Get off, I had to stick into my hands. So let's put that in. I tend to put the wool in towards the end because it goes, it's greedy. So I might even leave the other bits if you had thick woolly blanket, leave the other bits for a while before you put the wool in. Um, because the wool goes, yeah, slurpy slurpy and takes everything for himself. Um, and then I'm going to, the next thing I'm going to put is the little reel of, a little peg of silk thread. And make sure it stays under. And then I'm going to put the silk noil on the top in the hope that it weighs the thread down a bit. So again, just sort of spreading it out. Now I'm happy with that quantity of water. If you wanted a more uniform colour and you're not happy with blotchy, then you could, you know, put sort of water up to here. And all I'm going to do with that now is put it back on the range, bring it up to just a simmer, you know, just before it starts bubbling. And then I'll move it to a place on the range to keep it at that and I'll leave it for maybe half an hour. Um, and then I'll just leave it in the dye bath overnight. And then um, in the morning I'll get it out and um, see what I've got. So if I'd done this process as I'm telling you to do it, it would be first day make your dye bath leave overnight, second day strain your dye bath, um, put your cloth in, bring it back up to a simmer for half an hour, turn it off, leave it again overnight. So you've got two overnights. This is not, you know, instant gratification by any means. Um, and I strongly recommend that you do that. I, because of time constraints and, you know, my mummy has to take priority, of course, um, I'm going to do it slightly differently. Um, the other thing I haven't put in there yet is I showed you this bit of rust print at the beginning. Because they're, although it's neutralised and rinsed, there's probably still iron in it. So I'm not going to put it in now because it might have an effect on the other cloth that's already in there and I want to show you a pure result. So when I take all this other cloth out, then I'll put this in on its own um, and then we'll see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to go through exactly the same process with the brown onions as I just did there do exactly the same thing to them and then I'll be back in a little bit um, all that having been done and all the overnights having happened and so on. Um, I also just wanted to talk about other forms of kitchen waste that people use for dyeing with um, and my stand on it because I'm aware that I might, may have some questions um, in the comments. Um, I have been doing this for 15 years or so um, and right back in the beginning I played with all the things that I saw on the internet that people were playing with that are easily accessible things like beetroot, red cabbage, turmeric, um, stuff like that, other, other kitchen waste um, and it didn't work it's very um, fugitive is the term the colour doesn't stay even, even with proper pre-treatment mordanting and so on um, black beans is another thing um, and also they're very, very it's very very ph sensitive so while it may be fun to play with and it's you know nice with children and so on it's not something that i do um, anymore um, to me it was just a waste of time and energy and effort so please don't ask me about red cabbage and beetroot and so on um, so yeah i don't want to get up anybody's nose or anything um, you know, you do you as always, but I, I don't use those things anymore. Um, the other kitchen waste type things that people do use are pomegranate skins and avocado skins. And those two items do contain tannin and do, you know, do work. I'm not keen on the colour of avocado. That's just my personal choice. It's kind of a pinky beige colour. And also I don't eat avocados anymore, although I do love them. Since I discovered some of the um, farming of bees processes that are used to um, produce commercial avocados. If that's something that concerns you and you want to be more and you, you know you want to know more about then I'm sure Google will help you with that. Well that's that's just my personal choice. Um, pomegranates um, they don't grow here um, air miles and all that so you know there's there's other other ways of me getting 
those colours with things that I can source locally. So again, you do you, that's that's me, That that's what I do. But I just wanted to, you know, hopefully preempt some of the questions about um, red cabbage, beetroot, um, turmeric and so on. Okay, so I'm going to make my little eco-printing bundle. Um, I've got here the rest of my thrifted silk chiffon scarf. Um, I thought of using the silk noil, but I thought, you know, many of you might not have that. Um, you could use, you could try, if you've got a really old cotton sheet and it's not mordanted, you could try that, um, you know, if you just want to have a go. But ideally, if you've got something protein, you know, um, silk or, or wool, then that will work better um, with with this. So I've laid out my piece, which measures about a foot wide by uh, maybe 30 inches long, but that doesn't really matter. Um, you know, a small piece. And I've got my bit of dowel, um, and I want to make sure that my bit of dowel fits in my pan, and it doesn't, it's slightly too long. So anyway, I'll show you later, I'm just going to use one end of it. So this will get folded in half when we've laid everything on, that way. So I'm going to lay everything only on that half of it. So all I'm going to do is tear up some of these, or crumble up, or you know, into little bits, and spread them about only on half the piece. Um, how much you put will obviously affect how many prints you get. I'm just going to put a bit of each. If it's dry, it just crumbles, otherwise, you can just tear it with your fingers. I just scatter, I like, you know, organic, <laughs> that overused word. Well, I overuse it, certainly. Um, if you want to make pretty patterns, then you go for it. But just to, whoopsie, don't do that. This is damp, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned. I, I soaked this along with the other things for the, for the dye baths. So I'm just getting a kind of roughly even spread of the bits. That bit's a bit big. And this principle that I'm going to show you here with onion skins, this is how I eco print with leaves and everything, you know. Um, but I'm not going to get into that now, number one, because it's very early April and there's nearly no leaves available to me here in, um, here in France. Um, and number two, that's, like I said, um, I can only think of hors sujet, which is the French for, what is it? Off topic, that's it, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Off topic. But the basic principles are the same. So this is a good entry level if you haven't tried eco printing before. This is a good accessible way to get to grips with how it's done. It's not rocket science, but there are some things to bear in mind that I wish I knew when I first started um, that will give you better results. So I'm just giving a good scattering, trying to cover most of the cloth or half, you know, half the cloth. If you can hear that sound, that's the sound of Stella digging in her bed. Her bed is, you know, bedding. <laughs> she likes to dig in it. All right, I'm not gonna get them all on probably. But that'll do, that'll do pig. And now then, and you could just then fold that in half, wind it around your stick and you're good to go. But I'm going to have a little play since I've got this silk thread laying here. And I'm going to be careful because I don't want it to get tangly. But I'm going to just lay it on there like this. And this might all go horribly wrong. <laughs> but you know, nothing ventured. As you see, I'm just winding off lengths and laying them over the top of the skins. If you had thread already on a skein, you could lay a skein in there and sort of spread it out a little bit. What you really want is the things always that you're trying to print. You want contact between the thing you're trying to print and the thing you're printing with. I'm going to call that enough, otherwise it's going to be a bird's nest. You don't have to do that, you know, if you don't want to. That's just me because it was there. Um, and that's the one of the many wonderful things about this is once you get the basic principles 
um, down you can play. You can play and invent and you, you know it's very difficult to come up with anything new but anyway. So now I'm going to fold the other part over to make a little onion and silk thread sandwich. Silk is a bit tricksy. When it's damp it behaves a bit better. There we go. And now I'm going to wind, um, oh dear, am I now off shot? Let me try and turn you slightly. Don't get dizzy. There we go. I've got you, I've, you're, you're now slightly, I can use the word that I learnt from lovely Tracy um, at um, Moon and Sixpence, is she called, her YouTube channel? Anyway, Tracy Blanchard, I'll say it the French way. Anyway, the word is gushlantwise. You are now gushlantwise, which is another way of saying cattywampus. So I've laid my stick on, just slightly in from the edge, and I'm going to get my first wrap round the stick, so that I'm now complete. I've done one complete wrap, and the edge of the cloth is now under the stick. And then I put my hand here, and then I'm going to have to gushlantwise you the other way, like so. Can you see the other end now? Yep. And then I'm going to put my hand on that other end, and then I'm going to tension it ever so slightly. I don't want everything to move, and then roll. And because it's very fine silk chiffon, it is quite stretchy. But this applies to everything. You want your bundle. I'm just going to fiddle about with that crease a bit there. Not that I really mind creases. It just makes another interesting mark. Um, you want you want your cloth to be t as taut as possible around your stick, because that is all just about improving that contact. So as I wind with my right hand, I'm then holding with my left and just putting a little bit of tension in the cloth and trying to wind it straightly. Straightly? Is that a word? <laughs> Straight. <laughs> I'm not over stretching because it's quite stretchy cloth. If you had a firmer cloth, obviously it wouldn't, wouldn't stretch as much. And then I'm to the end. And I don't, you know, if things will shift about. This is one of the reasons why I don't really make pretty patterns. <laughs> it's too much, too much stressing over them staying in place while you wind. So then I'm just pushing the loose edge round like that so it lays flat and I've got the loose edge going away from me. I'll hold that and put you back somewhat straight. Slightly more pleasing to look at. And I've just got some normal jute string and I lay that on and hold it with my thumb now you see I've got it going the same way that the cloth is going, so that it's pulling against the cloth. Now I kind of wind it around my hand. My hands are quite strong. If you have um, weak hands, you know, or issues with gripping, you can get something like a, a peg that doesn't have silk around it, but that was laying there, and put your string around that, and use that. Like I did a double wrap so it locks, and you, and don't pull it off, <laughs> and use that to help you pull, you know, to get tension with. And then you can slide that along and pull, slide it along and pull. Obviously if it didn't have silk thread around it, it would work better. But that does work as a principle if you struggle with your grip. Um, I just wind it around my hand and I'm pulling as tightly as I can. And I'm spacing the wraps at this point about half an inch apart until I get to the end. I should have said, um, but you did see that I started in the middle. And then I'm going to come back the other way, crossing my previous wraps. And I'm the whole point of this is to get as good a contact as possible between the dye material, or the printing material, in this case the onion skins. Um, excuse me, I'll take my glasses off because they're sliding down my nose. Um, and, and the cloth, between the onion skins and the cloth. So pulling, so I've got to the middle, and now I'm going out again in the other direction, and if it's easier for you at this stage to turn it round, you can. And I'm coming towards me. And then back in towards the middle again. All the time pulling it as tightly as you can. The better the contact, the better the prints. So you just have to do the best you can. Um, a very good friend of mine and very ex experienced eco printer says that if you don't have string lines in your hands when you've made your bundle, you haven't done it tightly enough. Um, 
Right, so I've gone back to the middle. I'm going to put my thumb there and wrap once around my thumb, not super tightly, I don't want to hurt my thumb. And then I'm going to cut the end off. And then I'm going to tuck the end under where my thumb is and just pull that up. I don't make an actual knot, that for me is enough to, to hold it. And that's my EcoPrint bundle ready to go. Um, now I've been very silly and naughty because I've put it in the middle of the stick. And what I meant, because I forgot, what I meant to do was put it down one end of the stick um, so that it would, you know, I could put it in my pan like that. But anyway, I'll go with it like that, it'll have to work. Um, so, and that basically is how you make an eco print bundle, whether it's leaves or how I make an eco print bundle, whether it's with leaves or, you know, other, other materials. Um, there's many, many modifications you can then make to that, and I will go into those as the, as the weeks and months go on. Okay, so that's the eco print bundle. And that will then go into, now you can either just put that in plain water and bring it to a boil and boil it for a good hour, hour and a half. Or what I sometimes do with them as well is put them in um, an exhausted dye bath. So, for example, the onion skin baths, after I've dyed with them, um, then I can use them for cooking eco prints in, and that adds more colour into the thing. I think for this I'll just use plain water just to show you that. Um, so that will cook simmer in, in water for an hour and a half. Okay. Okay, I hope you can hear me because I don't have a microphone connected, so I'm shouting at my phone. Um, I'm going to get my eco bundle out of this. You see the colour of the what was plain water when it went in? This is my rather grubby range. Um, I've got these tongy things that I got from a junk shop. I think they're for fires actually, but they're good for bundles. So I'm going to get him out. And you see how coloured he is. Sorry, the steam. Get to one side. Um, and I'm just going to set it, I'm going to try not to drip all over my kitchen floor, although it wouldn't be the first time. I would normally do this outside, but it's windy and rainy, so I'm not. Um, right, you feel free to put it on something and not drip all over your floor. Uh, I'm going to let it cool a little bit, not much. Some people say you should leave them um, overnight, some people say you should leave them a week. I have done kind of semi-controlled experiments where I've done two similar or identical bundles, cooked them the same way, opened one straight away and left one a week and I don't see any difference. So I'm going to open it in a minute with the light on and show you. Okay, so this is the most exciting thing ever in the history of the world, opening an eco print bundle. I got this um, china bowl that I use just as a, you know, rubbish bowl rubbish for putting the bits in. So here's my where I put the string underneath. You'll see that even the string is a lovely colour. Another thing you can do actually that I didn't do is when you've got to this stage, when you've made your bundle, before you cook it, you could wind some thread around the outside of the bundle. Um, I often do that, I just forgot. And then you'll you'll dye your thread as well. And you know at the same time. Um, whilst I'm getting this out, you see I just pull that tail out. Um, I just want to tell you that I wouldn't normally cook one bundle in a pan. Um, I'm using my range, which is already hot, so, you know, I'm just thinking of energy consumption. Normally I would make several bundles and cook them together in the same pan. And while I'm talking, do you see the gorgeousness? I mean, why, why would you not want to get those string marks? There you go. I know it's personal choice, but I really don't understand why people don't want those. Look at that. Um, now I do this always in a very mindful and um, studied way because it's process, although we're not stitching, it's still for me it's a slow process that I enjoy. Um, so I'll show you how I do it and then you can, you can do you. So I get my string off, I set my bundle down and then I wind my string around my hand. <clears throat> And um, when I've taught in-person workshops in, in when I lived in England of doing this, there were people that would do it this way, and then there were people that would just throw everything, you know, and get hold of it and pull it and shake it just because they wanted to see the cloth. As always, you do you, but this is the way I do it. And I will keep and reuse my string. That's the string I started with. Do you see? And that's how it looks now. So we've also dyed the string. And I also would use this in cloth twine. I'm, I'd rinse it. 
um, and then use it in making the cloth twine you know you could twist that with a strip of cloth or just as it is you can use it for couching on in your stitching um, for making closures for pouches for all kinds of things okay so let's find the beginning and start to open it up now do remember this is only onion skins and it's wet at the moment obviously and it will need rinsing so everything will be lighter and um, <clears throat> uh, less intense when it's washed and dried and um, but look at that now there, I think there's something, well I'm pretty certain there's something in my dowel because near the beginning you'll see it's much darker and that's probably because my bit of, not dowel, my bit of broom handle has got iron in it. I use a lot of iron as a modifier because it makes everything darker and duller and that's just what I like. So just make sure you're in shot because I know when I was winding the bundle I kept pulling it towards me for which I apologise. Let's move those to one side. So I'm just going to open up, being aware that I put all that thread in there Just peeling back the two layers. Excuse my arm. I'm going up the other end. And the first thing I'm going to do is try and get that thread out without um, getting it too tangly. And with any luck, yeah, that's an end. Hopefully that's the last end. And I'm just going to, actually what I'm going to do is, and I make sure it's coming as it should, I'm going to, excuse me again, reaching across you. I'm going to wind it very spaced out around this dowel because I have to rinse this thread as well. And I find the best way to do that is to wind it round something. It's got bits of onion skin stuck to it here and there. Um, and also it stops it tangling. So I can wind it round this and then I can give it a good rinse. I'll probably take it outside and give it a good wash in one of the cleaner tubs of rainwater that I've got standing out there for starters. Um, and then finish it off with tap water. And of course once I've done all this and I have rinsed and washed and dried everything, I'll show you again. Um, which for you will be <clears throat> in this video and for me will be, you know, probably not straight away. We'll see. We'll see how the day goes. So I'm just being careful not to tangle it. And, but I can see here, I don't know if it's showing on the camera, if you keep it still so it focuses, and you see the different colours in the thread. There's yellows, oranges, darker reds. You're making variegated thread basically. Um, <clears throat> but when it's rinsed and dried, I'll put it uh, round a lolly stick, which is how I usually store my threads, uh, you know, a stick from a nice lolly. And... Um, and I'll show you it. This is silk sewing thread. I have no clue what weight it is. I would guess it's, it's about the equivalent of four strands of embroidery floss because it was given to me. Um, but it's, it's raining again just for a change. Um, it's, it's lovely to stitch with. It's quite fine but it's not super fine. And you could of course again do this with cotton thread but just be aware, as I said, that that is a cellulose fibre and technically, even with something like onion skins that have a lot of tannin, you will get better results if it's mordanted. And I will in future videos talk about mordanting. Um, gosh, it's really... Can you hear the rain? I think I'm nearly there for my thread. That's the last length. So I'm just running it through my fingers as I wind just to make sure there's no actual bits of onion on there. Oh no, there's a couple more lengths. But uh, yeah, I hope you can see how beautiful it is. I probably should have really put it around something clean. <laughs> well, this was laying here. There we go, that's the end of it. So there we go, that's my thread in its current state. And that's actually, it won't change much, it'll lighten a bit. Can you see it? my grubby hands 
but yeah, it's a beautiful thing to do if you can get hold of some undyed silk thread um, wherever in the world you are. So then the next thing to do is just literally to pick off. And again, you could take it outside and shake it if that was your, you know, if you wanted to get it done quick. But I like picking the bits off. Let me just make sure you're in the, you've got all of it in shot. I like picking the bits off. Especially when it's leaves. I mean, you know, onion skins, they're making little organic blobs. There's organic again. Um, they're making little organic blobs, but when you're printing with actual leaves, it's so fun to lift the leaf up and see the print underneath. And that's, I really like doing that leaf by leaf. <laughs> and just enjoying the process. I mean, you know, you get a beautiful thing at the end of it as well. But you might as well enjoy the journey. I'm probably going to go a little bit quicker than I would normally because you're all watching me. But, you know, feel free to fast forward. Um, and then when I'm done, I will go and rinse it. There's a bit of skin still. When you're, sometimes when you're eco-printing with leaves, you're picking, trying to get a leaf off. And then you realise it's not a leaf, it's the print. And then you know that is a good print. You know, that's a very good print. And you see, because this was a very thin cloth, uh, the silk chiffon, that the string marks are all the way through it. So, you know, if it was a thicker cloth, the string marks would have only been on that final wrap round where the string was actually touching. Um, but the string has acted as what's called a resist to the, the colour. And I just think that has made a beautiful result. Nearly done. Nearly done. There we go. There are two schools of thought about whether you should leave it to dry before you get the plant matter off. And sometimes if I'm using leaves that are very soft um, it, and you can't get them off, you know, they like perennial leaves of perennial plants rather than trees. Sometimes they go so squidgy in the process that they're really stuck to the cloth. And then I might leave it till it was dry. But the onion skins stay pretty robust, so... There we go. So I shall pick it up and put my hand under it and show you. Now, like I said, it is still damp, so that makes it darker. And it needs rinsing, because there will be unattached dye in there that you need to rinse away. Don't be afraid when you're rinsing that you're washing all the colour out. Everything that's coming out is not in the cloth and never will be. So, you know, don't don't skimp on the rinsing. So I'll go and rinse that and dry it. And you'll all be amazed to hear that eco prints are the one thing that I really love ironing. Um, because ironing them makes all the prints pop out even more. Um, so I shall iron it. <laughs> and um, then I'll be back and show you. I'll just scrumple it up like that as well. It also looks beautiful. See, I could you could wear that as it is, as a little scarf. Well, you might want to wash it and dry it first, but you could wear that as a little scarf and it would be beautiful, or a headscarf. In fact, I might do that. But anyway, I'll show you it when it's washed and dried. Okay, so here are my results. This is the brown onions. So you can see on the cotton, it's much paler and more yellow. Um, so these are my th two bits of sheet and my bit of cotton gauze. It's sort of a buttery yellow. And remember, that was the, about the same weight of onion skins as we had cloth. So the 100% waff weight of fibre. Um, but look at the results on the protein fibres. Um, so this is the chiffon scarf, the thrifted chiffon scarf. Interestingly, you see that the thread used to stitch it with is probably polyester. And I find that quite often on thrifted things, because it has taken nearly no colour. But it's a beautiful, rich sort of terracotta colour. Brown onions, don't forget. Brown or yellow onions, this is. Um, and there's the vintage Japanese kimono silk. Also a lovely, almost bronzy terracotta. I've just ironed them all carefully. And, I, and if you've been here for any length of time, you know that I'm not an ironer. 
by choice, although I do like to iron cloth that I've dyed and printed, I have to say. Um, but anyway, I don't want to screw it up, so I have to iron it again. This is um, the Silk Noil. Again, it's in that terracotta type colour. Um, now this was not um, scoured, it was just washed, so it is a bit blotchy. Um, but, you know, if you don't want blotchy, it, it needs at least new cloth or old cloth, whatever kind of cloth you get, needs at least a good hot wash. Um, with some, you know, with some washing soda or something like that. Um, but if you don't scour, you will. Do you see the blotch there? That's personal choice. I don't mind the blotching. Um, and this is my bit of woolly blanket, which had a darn in, which I think was cotton darned. It wasn't darned by me. I bought it with the darn in. Because it has taken some colour, but very pale. But I love that piece now. That's maybe going to be the inside of a journal cover or something, I think. Just love that colour. So that was the brown onion skins. Um, so you see that there's a marked difference between the protein fibres, you know, the silk on the wall, and the cellulose fibres, which was cotton. I didn't do linen, but linen would have been similar. Linen also, obviously, from a plant. Um, and that's the thread, which was silk thread. And I don't know if it's really picking up, but it's... Although it was just, it was right around that stick, it's kind of variegated because the outer layers of thread took more dye than the inner layers, and it's very pretty. Okay, so um, the red onion skins. <laughs> Not red. Um, so again, the cellulose is a yellowish, but it's got a greenish tinge to it, um, but quite pale. And the protein fibres are this lovely rich brown. I mean, look at, there on the Japanese kimono silk, it's already beautiful, but look at the richness on the, the silk chiffon and the, and the wool from red onion skins. I hope, the, I hope it's picking up the depth of colour in it. And there's one of the many things I love about natural dyes is the depth of colour. There's all different shades within. It's a solid colour but there's much more warmth and character to it than, say, if you just went and bought a commercially dyed bit of brown brown wool. It's not the same. I might be biased. <laughs> um, so there you see three different shades of brown. Um, no, that one. That's the silk oil. So those are all silk. So silk from my right, um, silk habitai, silk chiffon, silk oil. But three different shades of brown. Same process, same dye, dye bath, same onion skins. Um, and then the woolly blanket. And then here's my thread from the red onions, which is variegated brown and beige. It's a silk thread again. Um, so then the other thing I then did with the dye baths, I showed you right at the beginning those rust printed cloths. So this was the rust printed cloth as it was. So I put this piece in the brown onions. So if I compare, you see it's just made the background a deeper colour and it's actually changed the colour of the rust, it's darkened the colour of the rust marks as well. Um, and I just, I just, yeah, I think it's lovely. It's a lovely thing to do with rust, rust prints. Um, and my, my even more favourite is this rust print that went in the red onions because you get these greens when you combine red onions with, with iron. Um, look there, do you see? So if I compare that to, to how it was, it's distinctly green. And all I did was this, was after I'd taken the plain cloths out, I just kept the dye bath at warm. It wasn't even simmering, it was kind of just, just not, just below a simmer. Um, and then I put these in for half an hour. And then I took them out again. I didn't even leave them in overnight or anything. Um, so that's the rust prints. Um, and then on the subject of red onions and iron, what I then did was into my red onion dye bath, after I'd done all that and taken all that out, I threw a big hunk of rusty metal. It was a, like a, a gate hinge, you know, quite a sizable hunk. And then I brought the dye bath back up again to just below a simmer, and I put some more silk in, and I got these colours from the red onions. So that's silk noil and that's um, the vintage Japanese kimono silk. So that's with iron. And that is the same two cloths exactly without iron. I'll show you them side by side. 
So red onion skins and iron gives you olivey green, or me olivey green. Red onion skins without iron gives me these browns. And I say gives me because I know other natural dyes get greens without adding iron. I can only imagine there's iron in the water or something, um, but anyway. And the results might vary also even for me from time to time because onions, you know, depends where they're grown, how much sun they had, there's many, many variables. But the general message from this is if you don't want to get into mordanting and so on, I highly recommend trying to source protein um, fibres, you know, thrift some chiffon scarves or whatever, because you get much, much stronger effects on the protein than you do on the cotton and the linens. So the final thing I've got to show you is my Ecoprint chiffon scarf, um, which you saw me unbundle when it, when it was wet. So now it's washed and it's ironed and it's dry and I hope you can see how beautiful it is. I don't know whether it's better with the, cl no, the cloth behind turning it green. Um, if I've just put my hands behind, I'm wondering if I, I've got a bit of white sheet to put behind, about that behind it, that won't add much. So I've got the string marks, I've got many, I've got pinks, reds, greens, browns, yellows from the onions. Um, and it's just a lovely complex cloth. Can you see that? So that was the eco print and the thread that went in that bundle is here. And that, again, is much more interesting, I think, than, than those. I mean, those are nice, but this, because I laid it and it was touching different skins in different places and so on, that's got such a range of colours in. I hope you can see it against my hand. Um, again, reds, oranges, greens, yellows, golds, you know, all that whole range of colour. So there we go. So that is a little introduction to natural dyeing with onion skins. Um, it's pretty straightforward, I hope you'll agree, and I hope you're inspired to have a go. If you don't want to wait until you've saved up loads of onion skins for your own use, um, local supermarkets and greengrocers are generally not offended if you go in and ask if you can tidy up their onion bins, you know, the, the onion where, where they're selling their onions, because all the loose skins that are in the bottom they'll just throw away. So that's a good way of getting them. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for watching. Um, I, yeah, like I said, I hope you're inspired to have a go. If you have any questions about onion skin dyeing, please feel free to ask in the comments below. I said everything I had to say about um, red cabbage and beetroot and all that. Oh, I just wanted to add to that berries. I don't dye with berries either. The berries fall into the same category as red cabbage and beetroot, you know, blackberries, elderberries and so on. It's not colour fast. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for me. So um, anyway, so thank you so much for watching and I look forward to you joining me next time for more Cloth Tales. Bye bye.